Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Interviewing Wednesdays. It's uh, February 1st, 2023. For those people on Zoom, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please just put your questions into the Zoom chat window. For those watching on Facebook, please just send your questions into the comment field. We'll be sure to get those questions answered for you. Please note this event is being recorded and is currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, you give consent for your name and picture to appear. Please note that any comments you put in the Zoom chat window do not appear in the recording. And we do encourage everybody to put in your name, uh, companies that you're looking for, target companies, put in your LinkedIn address so that you can connect with everybody else who's on the call today. So uh, if you'd like to do that, please feel free to put that in the Zoom chat window. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Morris. Back in 2008, I started a website called careerdfw.org, a website to help those who are unemployed in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In 2012, I launched a second website, careerusa.org, to help those around the United States. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search that you may not know. It is available on Amazon, or if you see me in person, I have copies with me. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. The group's been around since the late 1990s. I took it over in 2007, and I'll tell you about our upcoming program this Friday at the end of this session. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team. You'll hear more about that in just a moment. Uh, our speaker today, we're doing a, for the last uh, four, three weeks and the next three weeks, we're uh, doing some special guest interviews, uh, speaker series. Uh, and uh, so you can see, so there's a lineup who we've had in the past and who's coming up. Uh, and then starting the middle of February, we'll start back up with the 13 part workshop again. Walt, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself sort of out of order since you're going to be our speaker today, but I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about the Interview Success Workshop. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. That QR code that you see there is a way to start an email to send to me to my Yahoo email address to register for the workshop. So what's the workshop all about? Well, number one, it's not what you expect in, in for practice interviewing. It's going to be something very different. It's going to be fundamentals, the fundamentals of selling, because we're in a selling situation when we're in an interview. I can remember after working 25 years and getting my first interview, uh, there's not enough letters in the alphabet to rate how I did on that interview. I mean, it was so poor, so badly done that I decided to make a difference and said, I can't do this again. I've got to do something different. Uh, the short story is it resulted in the Interview Success Workshop, which is designed to help us sell who we are, what we do, and how we help. The three elements that our companies are buying. They don't buy us just to do things. They buy us to say more than that. They buy us to say, uh, are you, do you fit in this culture? Is it a good culture fit? Uh, and can you achieve certain things that we need to get done? So how do we do that? So it's very informal. We've got basic categories of questions. It's not a smooth interview at all. You do get a recording of the interview, but we'll talk about the questions and the strategies, the approaches, because you can't just answer a question the same way every time. It depends on the question, the person asking, and where you are in the process. So there's always options available to us. Therefore, I would like to have you know what options that you have available so that when you get in a situation, you know which one you might want to choose as you want to respond to that question. So you have to be registered to attend. You can look me up on LinkedIn under Walt Glass and see what the about section tells you about the workshop, gives you a few more details. I typically schedule them on Tuesdays, 9 to 11 Central, and we do it over Zoom. And I do one or two people, no more than two people max. I used to do three at a time when we're meeting in person and we could do that, but three hours online is just quite a bear these days. So we don't do it that way. Be glad to have you participate. There's no need for you to have to have anxiety and stress during this practice interview in this learning situation. So I call it the learning interview and we have learning without squirming. Thank you very much, Walt. Uh, the practice of new team. Good morning or good afternoon, Ryan. Welcome back from your vacation. Thank you very much, all. Um, 
My name is Ron Layton. I'm uh, leading the pit crew at the moment for Mark McDonald. Um, our goal is to help you build confidence so that you'll be able to tell your story in an interview believably, comfortably, in a relaxed kind of manner. A um, couple of things. Number one, the mock interviews are free. Um, our motto is practice early, practice often. It's not one and done. If you want more than one, have more than one. If you're unemployed for a while and you want to keep having them every quarter or whatever, we're happy to do that for you, okay? Interviews are done by former hiring, former or even current hiring managers that have experience doing this kind of thing. Um, so I actually call them coaches and panelists, coaches slash panelists, because our job is to try to impart what we know to you to make you better and more comfortable at this. Um, as Walt said this year, we did have a price increase. We went up 10% from free to free plus 10%. So it's still free for everybody. There is absolutely no cost. If you send us a request to this email address, dallaspitcrew.com, we need three things from you. We need your resume. We need the job description that you want to have the mock interview for, and we need available times. Please give us at least two to four business days to get everything done. Um, since Monday, we've got a queue of six people. So sometimes uh, the queue can get quite large and it takes a while to get you know, all of the coaches panelists together uh, for that. Um, the other thing that I want you to know is that come March, we're going to change this format up a little. Um, a few years ago, we used to get 40 to 60 people in a room uh, pre-COVID on every Wednesday. Um, we're going to try again meeting in person every first and third Wednesday of the month starting on the first Wednesday of March, okay? So we will be meeting in person. There will be no Zoom on that day. So two Wednesdays of the month will be in person, no Zoom. The other two Wednesdays, the second and the fourth, we will do Zoom on those days. So they're gonna be kind of different. Um, the days that we're there in person, we wanna help you do some practice stuff. So we probably have a panel and people will be able to come up and practice things like, um, tell me about yourself or other kind of questions to give you some more practical, real experience that is probably going to happen because I'm seeing more and more um, in-person interviews. There's still a lot of remotes, but I'm seeing more uh, people actually having face-to-face -face interviews. All right. So uh, if you know people, let them know about the pit crew. If you've been a hiring manager before or want to volunteer, we look forward to that. Thank you very much. Don, thank, thank you very much. And I, can, I can't encourage everybody enough. Put on your pants, get out of the house, and go meet people in person. Come join the practice interview team on the first and third uh, Wednesdays. Come join the North Dallas Planner Career Focus Group on Fridays. Frisco Connect is starting up again next Tuesday. So you know, get out and meet people. If you live in the Dallas Fort Worth area, get out. I mean, you can't do it today because it's all icy and snowy, but you know, if possible, get out of the house and meet people because that's how you're really going to meet somebody. So, Ron, thank you very, very much. All right. Well, our speaker today is Walt Glass. Uh, everybody knows Walt. Everybody here knows Walt. We all know who he is. He does a great workshop. Everybody who's taken his class really appreciates what he's done and really has helped them prepare. So today, Walt's going to talk about distinctive interviewing. So Walt, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Am I visible? You are visible. It's amazing, this technology. I'm still getting used to it. Well, welcome to distinctive interviewing. Now, why distinctive interviewing? Because one of the things I want to focus on in the workshop is not only selling I am, I do, I help, but how we stand out. How are we memorable in a positive way to our interviewers? Uh, in the hiring process, they'll interview two or three people. And maybe on Monday, they come in and say, well, how were your interviews last week? And it says, well, you know, they were okay. Anybody stand out? And yes, you know, Ron, Ron Layton stood out and says, well, what, what is it was about Ron? And I said, well, 
It was just a good interview. I mean, sometimes they can't even describe it, but that means there was a connection made, some rapport built, some good discussion that took place, some confidence in hiring Ron and saying, I feel like there's a very low risk in pulling. So that kind of thing. So that's kind of what I'd like us to try to develop. So today we're going to focus on the distinctive part. We're going to conclude the I am, I do, I help, of course, but we want to talk about how do we really set ourselves apart in a very positive way. Let's see if this works. You need to share the sound. You need to go up on in Zoom. You've got to share sound when you did. I'm, I'm getting to it. Hang on a okay. second. Okay. Told you I was still learning how to use this stuff. Yeah, I know. Mrs. Carruthers, welcome. Thank you. Come on in, have a seat. Me. Of course. I have been um, looking over your resume and I have to say I am very impressed. Oh, thank you. You know, actually, I think, to be honest, you are overqualified to be an accountant. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. I don't intend to work very hard. Uh, really? Absolutely. In fact, I only intend to show up when I feel like it, which is good because I have a wide variety of extremely annoying personal habits and absolutely no sense of hygiene. Oh, you know, then I don't feel like you're then the correct person for this position. That's okay. I quit. You can't quit. You don't work here. Like I would ever work here. Like we would ever hire you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And even if you did work here, I wouldn't even give you the opportunity to quit because I would fire you. Well, you can't fire me because I don't work here. That's right. You don't. And I would can your ass so quick. Prove it. Okay. You've got the job. Thank you. You're welcome. And now it is my pleasure to inform you that I quit. You can't quit. I fired you. No, it's, it's too late. I don't, I don't work here anymore. Fine, let's try this again. You've got the job and now you're fired. No, you offered me the job, but I never accepted. Look, I've already worked for you. It's very tedious. And now you want me back. I, I think it's a regressive career move. Okay, what can we do to get you to come work for us? A raise. A raise. $200 an hour. 200 an hour. Okay, prorated to the 10 seconds you're going to be working here, so 12 cents. And this time I promise I won't quit. You promise you won't quit. You promise you'll let me fire you. If you still want to. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'm going to want to. So we have a deal? Not yet. I've already been an accountant here. I feel like I've outgrown the position. I want something higher. How about junior vice president? Junior vice president. $200 an hour or 12 cents, whichever comes first. And you promise not to quit before I have the opportunity to fire you. That's correct. Great. We've got the job. I accept. Great. Now you're fired. Oh, you, you can't fire me. I'm junior vice president. I'm your boss. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And since. as your boss, I regret that I have to fire you. Why are you firing me? Well, I, I, I can't help but notice as, as head of personnel, you've been hiring some very strange people lately at $200 an hour for me. What am I supposed to do without a job? 
Well, we do have a new position opening up in head of personnel. Do you have any experience? Because the new one sometimes is a challenge. It worked fine when I was testing it out so that I could move on to the next slide. <laughs> now it doesn't want to work. That's always the way it is. Yeah, you just need to X out in the upper corner. Well, we're seeing Zoom, not the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm trying to get it off that. Wait a minute, I'm going to move this slideshow on. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. All right, that was easy. <laughs> so there's there's a uh, uh, two minutes that I can uh, ha I'll make up. I'll I'll just take my Southern Texas drawl and talk a lot faster. So how do we sell ourselves and differentiate ourselves from other candidates? As we want to go through this, I'm going to tell you about some things, but I, I want to let you know that all of these are important. And I'd like you to listen to the things that we talk about from the interviewer's perspective. A lot of people ask me and they say, well, gee, I don't know when to contact back or I don't know when to do this. Or if I do this in an interview, what you, would that be OK? And I say, well, if you were the interviewer and you did that, what would you think about that candidate? And they almost always can answer the question themselves. Once they start thinking about the other side of the desk and how that sounds to that person, it becomes easily clear what sounds good and what doesn't sound so good. So I like that little poll here to kind of check out what the participants are and get to know you a little bit. And so here's a poll. And some of us don't have a direction yet. Uh, some do. We haven't gotten a specific yet. Uh, some have got it down to a couple of things, and I can, you know, go either job A or B. Uh, we could be in a particular job in the sales, finance, accounting, marketing, et cetera, or you have a specific job title and you have some target companies. And so is that poll effective now, Jeff? There we go. So I'm looking for 18 responses here. Looking for a couple more responses, up to 12, 14. 15, 16. Doing pretty good. 17, there you go. Everybody's done it. All right. I think I can hit the end button. So I'm now sharing the results so everybody can see it. All right. Uh, so this is pretty good to know that uh, from my perspective, you know, where you stand that you do have a specific job in mind uh, for, you know, 10 of, 10 of us are, are in that category. I've got some locations, picked out companies, 
So I'm working from that, which is a great place to be. That means to me that most of you have been in the job search a while because it takes a while to get to that point. Uh, if you're early in the job search, uh, you might be back in the AB category. Uh, for those of you doing uh, maybe job A or B, my advice to you is chase A and then chase B. Try not to do both at the same time. It's a killer. Uh, you can't be consistent with your resume, your LinkedIn profile, and your discussions with other people. They need to know what we really want. And so how can we do that? And then uh, you've got your type of job and the kind of thing that, that you won't settle. But we'd like to move you on down to the point where it says, yeah, and so now I want to pick out some companies and do some informational interviewing and start working and getting inside that through the networking. So thank you very much for sharing that information with me. Where did my car go? So we're selling. What are we selling? We're selling ourselves. And how do we define it? by the soft skills and characteristics, our experience and our hard skills and solutions to problems and needs. And so I'll put together this I am, I do help model back in the year 2000. It was like uh, January, February of 2000 after I was early retired in 1999, about Christmas time. So that's the main thing. So the foundation is our focus. So when we are looking to respond to questions, and I use the word respond instead of answer. It means a little bit more response to me than answer. Answer just says, I'm just gonna answer the question. Responses include answering motives, answering the question, doing some other things than just, just answering the question. I like to get us out of the mode of just answering the question itself. But we're gonna demonstrate and inform who we are, what we do, particularly what we do that energizes us. It says, I look forward to going to work every day. And how we can help, the value that we bring. So distinctive interviewing today is gonna to look at the top 10. So what are all these things that we can do? So this is kind of like the Letterman top 10, if you remember that. I don't know if he's still doing it. I don't even know if Letterman's still on TV or not, because I don't watch late night TV. All of these are important though. So let's look at our experience. So tell me why I picked the, the least effective, but still very important, to be experienced. Anybody have any ideas? Just unmute and jump in. We call this PBI, presentation by interruption. Companies want to know that you have done what they're looking for, that they're not going to train you from scratch generally. Right. Well, if you've made the interview, would you agree that you've passed the screening part? You know, the first interview that you get might be a call from someone. And so it's not one of these scheduled interviews. It's something that you get uh, by a phone call. And what are they checking? The majority of the time is just, can you do this job? Do you have the experience? Do you have the education knowledge? Do you have the skills? And then that's that's enough to say, okay, now we're going to schedule a real interview. I call the first one is just kind of like a due diligence from the recruiter's point of view, whether it's internal or external recruiter. And they're going to find out if uh, you might be a potential candidate. And you pretty much pass the experience test. So most people that are being interviewed by a company, they feel pretty much that you already can do the job. That doesn't mean we don't, don't talk about it. We certainly are going to talk about it. But that's why I think it's number 10 is that I experience. And that's kind of the given once you've got into the job, into the job interview. All right. Typical resume experience statements. Now, I'm not saying these are bullets underneath something, but these are the kind of things I can see in resumes that I've built and maintained customer relationships, increased satisfaction, met my sales quotas, I increased revenue and profit. Now, I'd like to just kind of say that. We're going to come back to this a little bit later. Video interviewing is the next thing. Now we've got to learn how to be on TV. Uh, we got to look good on that. we got to make a difference with that. Now, guess what? They don't. 
they don't have to do as well as we need to do because of those impressions and how we appear, how we talk, how we sound. Uh, I just I just love looking to the camera. Oh, what a fun time. It's one of the worst things I, I think I could, that I do is when I make these presentations, I can't look at people. I have to look right into the camera to make my connection and contact with you. What do you think the number one mistake is that we make with video interviewing? I'd rather you unmute, jump in and talk. You can put things in chat. Jeff could help me monitor chat. He knows how to do that job very well. He's only been doing it for two and a half years. Well, Walt, I, I think you may have given it away when you said yeah. uh, that you don't like looking at the camera. I mean, as you said, <laughs> if you're looking at the person, then it, the impression that they're going to get is that you're you're maybe you're looking at notes or you're looking away or you're checking email while you're going through the interview, and it can seem very distracting. Well, you hit the key word there. I think that's the number two is not looking to the camera. But the number one mistake we make is how we look, what appears. It's actually anything that causes distraction, right? Distraction says I am the interviewer will be paying attention to something else while I'm what I'm looking at, which reduces my ability to hear what you're saying. And my focus is not on you talking. My focus is on something else. And so any type of distraction, so your, your background has to be right. It can't be distracting. I've seen ceiling fans, you know, spinning overhead and so that. Uh, I've seen some libraries and some of them are so close that I'm very interested in trying to read the titles of the books. Uh, but anything that would appear to be distracting. And of course, there's a different kinds that you can use. A marketing person might use something as a, as a good marketing background, all right, not, not a plain background. Anything that causes distraction. Other things that cause distractions are barking dogs, cats walking across the keyboard. As in one case, it happened. The wife walked behind the uh, person doing the interview, and she wasn't wearing anything at the time. So these kind of things can cause pretty strong distraction. And we don't want to do that. People, you know, I, I was talking to someone. I said, well, I'm really kind of working on this presentation, and I'm trying to get the slides and everything so that they look good and they're appealing, whatever, like this is, oh, you're just OCD. And I said, no, I'm not. Well, I might be OCD, but what, you know, people are going to make judgments on the way my slides look, all right? They're going to make judgments about that. So I want them to look professional. I want them to look good. But nonetheless, that distraction is the one. So here's a couple of things. And there's a whole session on video interviewing. Jeff will talk about 13 sessions at the end of this that Mark and I put together. And there's just one totally on the video itself. And here's kind of a nutshell. Make sure you test everything in advance, all right? Like I tested that video that I ran this morning uh, just a few minutes ago, and it worked fine. It stopped fine. I went to the next slide and did everything. Then it didn't work. But anyway, I, <laughs> I tried to do that test. Your camera position, you don't be looking up or down. You want some space between you and your top, okay? You don't want to be like this, where you cut off at the top, and you don't want to be doing down here like that. So eye level, get the right environment, nice, free from distractions, well lit. You might want to work getting some lighting so that you look better on lighting. If I turn off my, my two lamps, I look like this. Turn them on, and I look like this. So I get a little bit better lighting on. Get a professional dress, which is really like they dressed. Have the phone number in case you you know something's not working, so you can contact somebody and then practice. I want to put practice, 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 practice for that for the video stuff. Now during the interview, log in early. Never be late. I love Jeff's phrase that says, "If you're not early, you're late." So always be there early. Smiling, all right. Smiling is something that comes from within. It's a result of what we're thinking and feeling, but smiling makes a huge difference. I've been working on smiling since, oh, I would say 1971. <laughs> and I still need to work on it some more. Good posture. You want to be authentic. You want to be yourself. You want to be authentic. And that is very important because if you, you've got to be somebody else, then when you get the job, you've got to be somebody else every day at work. And that will not last long. Be uh, display genuine energy and interest. And that's going to be your tone of voice, the way you say things, the inflection, uh, the fun that you had doing something particular can, can show through. 
how do you, you know, when they're talking, you know, nod. And that's about the only thing they see is just a little bit of us now. And you can nod to say, yeah, I'm hearing, I'm understanding, I'm listening to you. And it's a nice little habit that we do. We don't recognize we're doing some time, and that's touching our face. So that's just a quick overview of that. Number eight, questions that we ask. I was doing some uh, looking around on the internet, fishing for things, and I ran into uh, an interview with George Wright, who at the time was the VP of IT operations at the United States Postal Service. And he had some comments that I thought fit very well in what interviewers are looking for. And I thought I would include a few here. So he says, I asked the candidate for if they have any questions. Why does he ask the question? Remember, every question has the question, the person asking the question, and where you are in the process as the three parameters to decide what options we might choose. But he says, I want to know how insightful you are. But your questions tell the interviewer what's important to the candidate. All right. If I'm asking these things that I'm important, you know, think that's important. So what should we not do? One of the first questions is, uh, please tell me about the benefits. All right. Well, that's an obvious thing we don't want to do. We want to wait until the offer until we start talking about benefits. But if I'm telling you I want this job because of benefits, not because of the job and the value I bring, but I really need the benefits, which is probably true. We do need the benefits, but we can't. We don't want to set up that way. We don't want to show that, that at that time. Now, it's going to be important later, but not <laughs> during the interview. So since we're going to be evaluated, <clears throat> question is, is what question list did you prepare? Do you have one prepared? Is it prioritized? What do I need to know for me to make a decision that I want to work here? And I have to have them prioritized because I may not get to ask very many of them. It's a, it's a part of things that said by asking questions, we create a conversation. We would love to have a conversation or interview, not an interrogation. Don't wait until the end to ask your questions. The interview is over. You can't discuss anything by getting into a conversation about a particular topic when you ask a question. Now, there are a few questions that, that we're going to bring up that you want to mention at the end, but it's, it's all part of closing the interview. My suggestion to you is this. There's two basic kind of questions that I came up with and said, all right, here's the two types. One are gen what I call generic questions. Uh, it's my own definition of generic, but I'll say uh, something about the, something specific about the job. I'll ask about a typical day at the job, you know, or a typical week or something like that. Those are generic questions. And then there's the company specific questions, which are based on some information that you've learned through whatever source that you've learned in information, interviews, web research, Google, however, it says, well, I saw in the 10K in section five, the management discussion analysis that management was saying this, because that's where they are, management's talking about their company and I got some good data. Uh, one person used the, uh, I was listening to your video of your quarterly earnings. And the CEO said, we've got to develop more products with a higher margins. Why was that an important question for that candidate? It's because he was in product development. He, that's what he does. He can help you develop these more products. So it was a very important question for him to ask in there. So that company specific, it also demonstrates we've done some research, which is a very positive thing. People also ask me, well, you know, how often should we talk and they talk? And so a good mix, I, just as a guideline, is that 70% of the time we're talking and about 30% of the time they are talking. The traditional model is uh, I'm just here to answer questions and get out of Dodge. Uh, one, the, one end of the spectrum on an interview is, please, God, help me answer these questions. Get in, answer them, hope they choose us. Uh, not a very effective model. However, Believe it or not, there's a lot of people who feel like my job is just to answer these questions as best I can and hope they choose me. So I would like to suggest we change that mindset and say, all right, let's do the strategic model. They need something. And we have skills and accomplishments, all right? And we're going to talk about these things during the interview. I remember when I first started interviewing and hiring people, I was the boss behind the desk. 
Okay, I was in control. And I was the person that says, uh, you know, you just answer this and, and I'll figure it out. And as I got later on, got higher responsibilities and got into more interviewing, I started getting from behind the desk, started getting into conversations and enjoying a conversation and talking about them and letting them feel comfortable. So anyway, I, I, I got better at interviewing. But this is the model that we like to try to accomplish in doing that. And it's like uh, I'm here to make an offer you can't refuse. Here's all the reasons why you should hire me. Here's who I am. Here's what I do. Here's how I help. So I'm looking at it as I'm responsible for putting you in a position to know what you need to know so that you will hire me and why you would do that. Different model. Number seven, this one is pretty key. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier in the beginning. It says, uh, you know, listening and speaking in their frame of reference. We get caught in when we're talking to people to just think about our world and us and what it means. I can remember uh, when I wasn't a very effective communicator, I thought I was a great communicator, but I wasn't because I would patiently wait for people to finish telling me what they were telling me, and then I'd straighten them out, <laughs> okay? And that wasn't a very effective way to handle things, but that's what it was. And um, one day somebody gave me a piece of feedback that says, why are you always right? And boy, did that ever hit me in the face because I didn't want to be that kind of person that appeared that I was always right. My manager told me that he had that feedback and, and I said, well, what'd you tell him? I said, well, he usually is, which kind of reinforced, yeah, I'm always right. <laughs> But I had to change that. I had to do that. And the way I did it was listening to other people, not just listen to my response and tell them my way, whatever it is, but listening and speaking in their frame of reference. Why did they ask this question? Um, I was on a presentation on Monday and a person asked me about, well, I'm concerned about um, the overqualified part where I might be a threat to the manager. And how would I... How would I handle that? I said, well, if you feel that threat, it has to be real, it has to be authentic. But if you come across and say, oh, well, I'm very interested in doing two things here. One is being very, very successful and contributing a lot to the company. And the other thing is to be successful and contributing very lot to the team members and to you. One of my jobs is to make you look good and to have you look successful, all right? That wasn't the answer to the question. It was it was just a, here's what I'm saying to you and telling you so that you know where I'm coming from and what my purpose is and what I'm trying to do. I.e., if you're concerned about me being a threat, I'm answering the potential threat. I'm just not, just not talking. All right. Their agenda. Here's a question for you that you get in the interview. It's one of the questions I put into some of the questions in the interview work. So what gives you the greatest satisfaction from a professional standpoint? So listen to these two answers. I really enjoy completing projects, collaborating, and working with cross-functional teams. Is there anything wrong with that answer? Not really. I mean, it's not a bad answer. It's not a mistake. It's not an error. But I think we're missing the opportunity to that sell. I am, I do, I help. I really enjoy collaborating with cross-functional teams and completing projects. That increased value, provide customer references, more sales, positive impact or bottom line, right? Here's some of what I do and what I help. So the first one is all kind of I do. And the second one says, hey, it's telling you that I am and it's results driven. That's kind of implied in it, all right? It talks about what I do as well as the things I can help. Therefore, as we do in the workshop, we're looking how can in our responses, we sell, I am, I do, and I help. You don't have to sell all three in every response, but a lot of times we can at least do two of them. So you would look at it. It's not just answering that question. It's selling, get into that selling mode. We want to stay on their agenda, all right? It's kind of risky to answer questions in a way where we're seeing or appear like we're taking over the interview. That's not our, um, that's not their frame of reference. That's maybe our frame of reference. So, of course, we should let the interviewer control it. We be, and how do we do it? We answer their questions. We make responses, not just the answers, and we follow their agenda. However, that doesn't mean we can't get permission to change the agenda. So if you want to say something a little bit different or you want to do something else instead beforehand, there's a phrase that I call, would it be all right with you? In other words, 
can I get permission to change your agenda and then do something different than we, than we plan to do? All right. What are your strengths? Here's how an example of a question uh, or response that I might give. Among others, I practice integrity and responsibility and focus on getting things done. Integrity and responsible are I am's. Getting things done is I help. Then I might ask if they want me to tell them about a time when I applied any of these strengths. Let's see if we want to get into a discussion about using those, you know, using those strengths. Asking them to, if you want to tell a story about it, gives them permission to either say yes or no, I don't need a story, I would like to hear a story, whichever, but that's still staying on their agenda. What are your sour requirements? I'd be glad to answer that question. It would be all right with you. We discuss more about the company duties and responsibilities and expectations. I like that kind of answer for the recruiter that calls and says, I want to know your sour requirements, and you don't know anything. You don't know anything. And so you say, gee, can you tell me a little bit about the job, the company, what's going on, what's happening before I answer that? You can decide when to reply to questions with different options. And salary has many options to choose from, again, depending on when and who's asking and where in the process. Number six, what can we do for them? What we can do for them. So John Kennedy, you know, I said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. If you're going to an interview and they're, you're asking, you're being asked about, you know, what are you looking for in a job? And you say, well, I'm looking for collaboration and teamwork and I'm looking for this and I'm looking, you know, here's, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for training. I'm looking, whatever it is. And it's all I, 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 I. It's all about us and what we want. All right. What if we change that around and said, uh, 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 what I'm really excited about doing in this job is, and then I list the kind of achievements and things that I can do that prove my value to you for the company. And I'm more driven by the achievements, by the activities. Now, I want both. As an interviewer, I want you to love your job. I want you to enjoy doing your job. I want you to be collaborative and team. I, I like all those things. But boy, if you tell me that the first thing off the top of your mind is achieving these things and doing that stuff, I remember when I got a job, I was right out of college and uh, working for a small company. I walked in to the uh, owner's office. It was a small company, $3 million, 100 people. And I was kind of the office manager and financial person. And after I'd been there for a week, I said, Mac, can I see you for a few minutes? And I said, he said, yeah. I said, well, I've been looking at the financials and been looking at everything and seeing what's going on. Mac, you're not making enough money. <laughs> and he said, now you're talking my language. All right. So I got his attention by saying, you know, I was going to introduce some cost savings ideas and thoughts. But I let off with from his perspective. If I just went in there and said, uh, I got some ideas for cost reductions. Um, that might have been OK, whatever. But it was much stronger when in, I'll put it in his because when you, you're the owner of a company, the company's not paying you. It's coming out of the owner's pocket. All right. <laughs> He's paying you right out of his wallet. So you want, you want to make sure that you understand where he's coming from. All right. A list of achievements, including the value. If you look at that uh, statement that I had on typical resume statements that are made somewhere in the resume, they were all general. They uh, increase profit, turn, you know, customer satisfaction, improve that. So they were general. The interviewers that hear all these general things hear those things over and over and over again, and they don't really push the value of that. We, I would suggest that anytime we talk about a generality in the value, we give a specific. So I want to know what are my achievements? Generically, uh, I turn customers around. Specifically, Here's a customer that I've turned around saving X amount of dollars a year in annual revenue and also generated a uh, few more sales by having that person and that company be a referral for a potential sale. That's going to be a lot more specific and a lot better. So revised resume statements. So somewhere in the resume, it's not necessarily a bullet, but so I, I, I have built, maintained, partner relationships, met quotas, 
increased revenue, profit, and customer satisfaction. So there's some I do and some generalities. Now I've got three bullets and I've increased the win rate from sub zero to seven percent for contracts over a billion dollars. Generated 2.8 million a year. Additional revenue, saving the client 1.3 million a year. It was a 30 uh, million dollar client, right? Actually, this is some of the stuff off of my, my old resume, what I used to do. And I increased uh, customer satisfaction 500%. So I can give an example, each one and tell a story about how that relationship allowed me to increase the customer satisfaction 500%. How did I meet the sales quotas, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got all that back up. Soft skills. I, I don't know. Soft skills I almost want to put as a, as a higher thing because it's really important. But soft skills are really the selling skills. The kind of person we are and the personality and the characteristics are pretty strong. So they're demonstrated by our soft skills. So I went out and I, did, I looked up uh, something on the site. And, uh, see job descriptions and say, you must have strong interpersonal skills. I said, okay, well, here's 86 of them. That's not very defined as to what interpersonal you know, skills. Generally, I think when job descriptions have this phrase in it, they mean works well with others. You remember that? I don't know. In the first grade, that little bullet you had works well with others is a bullet in, there, in your report card. So I looked at all of these things and I kind of went through them and saw it. I did my own, you know, I'm preaching we should do this and pick out some things. And so I did. And I went through and looked at it. And I want to tell you, uh, there's about 40 of them that I thought fit, you know, fit me. And then I said, oh, I'm getting a swelled head. I better quit here because it's actually 60 that fit me. Uh, so what, what are the top five? What are the top three? What are the top ones that really make a difference in this particular role? Who does not want a project manager that is not detail-oriented? Okay, <laughs> they have to have some strength in that. So what are your interpersonal skills? All kinds of assessments out there that you can look at. Uh, here's an example for responsibility that I would use. Well, I'm a very responsible person. And with that, I take ownership of what I say and do. And adding integrity, trustworthiness, and dependability, you can rely on me. There is the value of the strengths in that statement. And so it's a matter of saying, gee, I misspelled responsible. I got to check that. But it's the idea of saying, not, here's an opportunity not to just to sell the soft skill and the iron part, but an opportunity to say, here's what the value of that soft skill is. So I'm always looking for value. Can I add value somewhere? You, you, you can't just do it every question, but you still want to sell. It's probably the least thing that I see in practice interview is the bringing forth the value that you bring to this job. It's the answer to the question, why should I hire you? Are you ready to answer that? What is it? And it's because I am this kind of person. I love doing these kind of activities and putting those together. I can help you with these types of results. All right. Whole basis of the workshop. All right, I want to bring this in because at this point in time, it, I, I'm bringing in a resume, but I'm bringing it in as an example of what we should be doing and saying in an interview. Some of you may know Jack Beck. He's a career coach. He used to live here locally, but the rascal moved to Florida. And I was talking with him yesterday. And he was telling me that he going down to the beach, it was going to be about 80 degrees. And I said, oh, you poor boy, I feel so sorry for you. But here's what he says in a resume. Let's just kind of look at this. Uh, he calls this the, the selling resume. It's a one-page deal. It's all designed to get a phone call. It doesn't go into the whole detail. Now, we also have a two-page resume, but he calls it offering. You see, you can place your trust. Here is a soft skill right off the bat that says you can trust me. Trust is a huge soft skill. I rarely see that listed in anybody's strengths as you can trust me. I'm a trusting person and you can trust me. All right. Trust is a big deal. Um, 
I had a new philosophy uh, going back personally. Um, everybody kept saying, trust has to be earned. Trust has to be earned. And I said, why? Why can't we give trust away and start off trusting each other? And then you might get burned once in a while. But if I just start off with trust and give that to you as a gift right off the bat, wouldn't that be a lot better place in the world to live? All right, so then he talks about knowledge and experience that he has. He's written a book. He says, my, to know every client. Then he says, here's some value. 90% clients are successful in their job search. Here is a result. Then as a, here's experience again. I've done this, turn around, startup specialist, business journal, hire, train, coach. All right. And as a result of doing those kind of activities, five of my original staff, became publishers and some still consulting. So here's here's kind of what I've done and the value that I'm bringing. And I've got some specifics to tell you a 90% success rate to tell you I do get results because he called himself the career coach for results. And then he went into the experience and he only put like a bullet or two for each one of those. He didn't go into a lot of detail. But the idea is see how he is selling. I am, I do, I help. And it's with this kind of attitude and information that we want to do in the interview as well. Company knowledge, number four. Huge differentiator here on how much knowledge you have. And it's all in different areas. What do you know about the company itself? Uh, if you're just going to quote to me two or three things you looked at the first page, and the phrase, well, I know you're in the top 50 or the top 100 or the top 500, you know, or you're in the best companies to work for. If I just know some very minimal items, that's not very impressive to me at all, or if you don't know very much about it at all. Um, I would say that your first question should be, should not be, well, what do y'all do here? You know, that's just not what we want to go in, right? So doing your research on the industry, the competition, the company itself, who are their customers? And, and there's a lot of this advantage on the website. I will tell you this, uh, Toyota and Amazon, if you've looked at those sites, do a huge amount of selling you about the company before you ever get to the careers page. You have to scroll all the way down to get to the careers page. And there's testimonials and there's things. Great information that you can learn and use during the interview. So, well, you know, one of the testimonials you had, you had a person named Walt on your webpage that was talking about this part of working here at Amazon. Now, I'm interested. What would you say are, you know, and then you can ask a question. So here's what this person is saying. Now, I like your comments on the same thing. Company knowledge is huge. Four hours of research for one hour of interview. And then George says, you know, you better know something about the company. You better have some understanding and the objective of the position, i.e. how we can help, right? Do everything you can to find out how the company perceives the position and address what they're looking for. What are they looking for? I am, I do, and I help. Plenty of places to go find information. I'm going to pull, pick out a couple of them. The one in the middle says informational interviews, I think is huge. Uh, most job seekers, you know, the, the people that are in the helping job seekers business, the, the Foster Williams, the Jeff Morris's, and, all of those were all talking about doing these informational interviews as the shortest path to success in getting a job that you want. There's another website, uh, Data Axel Reference Solutions, that you can get through your library, and that will help you pick out companies to target. And it also gives you information about those companies, and it also gives you competitors of that type of company. Uh, so go to your library, ask them for, it used to be Reference USA. There's also another database called uh, uh, A to Z, and it's very, very similar. But you have a lot of parameters that you can use to select uh, how far from where you live, type of industry, uh, size, all, all sorts of parameters you can choose to say it's the kind of company you're looking for. And it helps you find those companies according to the parameters that you've set. As you say, hey, maybe these are the places I want to work. All right. Amazon on their website. Uh, um, Beth Galetti, this was, I found this back on March a couple of years ago. She says that really to teach it, getting hired is to know our leadership principles. They have this set of leadership principles. And particular, the leadership principle of customer obsession and 
mission to that. They're telling you what's important to them in this company. These are the kind of people we're looking for. I mean, my goodness, they're putting it right out front. I'm looking for this kind of person. It's a lot better than just the job description. You can't trust job descriptions all the time either. But here they are. And we like to find people who like to build, invent, have a passion for making an impact. All right. There's the passion statement. Great things, great things to know. And actually, if you go out to the website, here's their 16 different uh, leadership principles. If you were to go to an Amazon uh, interview, I would suggest we better know a lot about these principles. Uh, if, even if you said it's very interesting that Jeff Bezos a added uh, the last two in the last couple of years. And it's kind of interesting. Do you know any story or something about that? Or which ones out of the leadership principles that you list do you think are really key to be successful in this role? Maybe a nice question to ask. What kind of leadership? And they expected everyone to be a leader, not just those that are in a management positions. So Yellow has another example. And I looked up their logo, did the history on their logo. It took them five years to develop the logo. And I said, gee, it means all these things. And what I could do in an interview says, well, I know I really was interested in your logo. And I'm going to talk some facts about it, about how it means the fact that it looks the same whether you're looking in the rear view mirror or you're looking straight on and what those things and areas represent. Uh, be interesting for us to say, hey, I'll bet you some of the employees at Toyota don't know the history of their own logo. But you come in and talk about it and say, gee, all these things that this logo represents matches me. Right. That's a very, very strong message. Very strong differentiator. So there's a couple of examples. Number four. Pausing before answering. One of my favorites. Uh, I don't know about you, but I hate silence. I just can't stand it. <laughs> when somebody asks me something and I don't have an answer coming up, I get pretty nervous and a little bit anxiety shows up and that I need to talk. And my goodness, I, I just have to say something. I, I can't wait. And, and by the way, if, the, if I don't answer quickly, then that's going to be bad. Well, actually, the opposite is true. Stopping and thinking and pausing before you answer is better. And so I have a question. How does pausing increase positive differentiation? Well, I only thought of nine things. So it's polite, allows a control of our emotions. It's time for us to take a breath. Taking a breath helps clear our mind. If you if you read and look up things, it's like breathing in water solves everything. You know, drink a lot of water. And reduces pain. It does a lot of good things. Breathing helps us. Talking and thinking don't mix when you're doing it at the same time. Let's separate them and let's think and then talk. We want to have brevity. Let them ask for more details. But what is it that I'm going to say? Now, even when I have an answer and I have some information and content that I want to give, I still might want to pause and think about it, because I would really not want to talk too long. It's very interesting. We're asked a question, and we have a tendency to talk too long in general, all right? And the reason we talk too long is because we don't know what we're going to say. <laughs> That's the primary reason. You can't prepare every single answer ahead of time. You just can't do that. It doesn't exist. You never know what you're going to get but pausing and thinking about it. So gives us time to think. Make sure we understand the question. One of the ways I suggest we learn how to pause is to mentally repeat the question in our mind. If we're repeating the question in our mind, it does two things. One, it makes us focus on the question. And then it helps us also relax a little bit and then start thinking about how we might respond. I remember in one of the practice interviews, a person was asked the question, what do you think about Microsoft Azure? Now, Azure is an operating system, all right? It's kind of like Windows. Uh, but anyway, he didn't hear the word Azure. He started answering the question before they even finished asking the question. He answered, what do you like or know about Microsoft? So he didn't even get the question. He wasn't a good listener. He touts himself as a great communicator, doesn't listen well, answers the wrong thing on the question, all right? 
pretty bad example. So that helps us make sure we understand that. So we are a better listener. We can have short answers without being necessarily rude. We look thoughtful and confident, and we compliment the interview, saying this is an important question, something I need to stop and think about. So it implies that. And just, just as a plus, when you get a tough question and we're stopping and thinking about it, it doesn't stand out as a tough question because we're doing this for, for almost all the questions. Pausing before answering. So what does George say? He says, when that question asked, did they think about it, i.e., pause? and give an answer that was specific, right? So how do, we, how do we stay on the agenda? How do we work with the interviewers? We answer their questions and we stay on the agenda, all right? We don't take over and take control. It's important to me how well they listen and how well they respond in clear, concise terms. So that thinking about it is pausing and then giving a nice, clear, concise response. Number three, star stories. Probably most of you are very familiar with behavioral event interviewing questions and the star story responses. And I pick on star stories because of the power that a star story has. So in case you haven't heard about it before, what does it stand for? It's the answer to questions of tell me about a time when or give me an example of. Some companies adopt this behavioral event interviewing as their style of interviewing. They ask all those kind of questions. Give us stories about this. And it's built on the, on the uh, idea that past performance predicts future behavior. If you've done it this way before, you will do it this way again, and you do it here. And it really tells that. So the situation, task, action, result. Again, brevity. About 90 seconds max for any question is a general rule. <clears throat> Let them ask for more detail. But the situation in the task can be extremely short. When I was the customer relationship manager selling services to colleges and universities in Texas, I had a CIO accuse me of bait and switch. All right, that's one sentence. The, the reason I put the situation, some people call cars and do the cars and just challenge action result. I like the situation because if you don't include the job title to show some kind of context of your responsibility and authority in your role in the story, and I don't know where you are in that sense. So as you took actions and you did things, I, I would really like to know a little bit more about behind that. So that's why I think the situation should tell what was your job title? And you can list the company. It's optional if you want to talk about which company it was. But when I was with this, uh, if it was a company that does not, is not relevant to this particular job, you don't want to mention it at all, right? And, and I've already implied what the task was. How am, I, how am I going to handle a CIO that accused me of bait and switch? And so what I did was, and I like to use these phrases to help us keep it brief, and so here's the first thing I did, the second thing I did, the third thing, high level, all right? And let them ask for more detail. And then as a result, and I want to give the value of what happened with that. We all want to hear what happened. Dollars are the best. Numbers next, percentages, and then value. You might have turned a customer around, but what did that save in dollars? What did that do? Did that create additional sales? What kind of amounts of sales did that increase? Those kind of things. So we were looking for those. So the impact of these, what happens with our brains? We actually <clears throat> are more engaged and responds better than just to give data and facts. Uh, one of the things that gets people attention is I remember one time when, and when we were about to hear a story, uh, children's stories. Children's stories don't just tell the story. There's something that they want that child to learn in these stories and they talk about something. There's something going on behind. Um, it's a little, it's it's a step down from music. Uh, music and words are very much prevalent in our minds. We can remember that. Um, so that's why we do the ABC song. I don't know if they still do that in school or not, but most people can learn the ABC song. When I went to see uh, a movie years ago, uh, I can't remember the name of it all of a sudden, but uh, the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious was in the movie. So you might remember the title of that movie. 
Well, I walked out of there and I said super something, but all the kids were saying the whole word. I mean, they had learned it and they'd done it quickly. All right, so it activates areas where our listeners turn the story into their own experience it's called neural coupling. They identify with us as we go through the story. That's building a connection. That's make, building a rapport. Very, very strong. And we can't really process the distinction between a story we hear or read and one that actually happened to us. There's, I know that I identified with uh, Tom when he was still hanging out of a window in one of the Mission Impossible movies. And Cruz was up there pretty high, and I don't like heights. And so I was, I was quite anxious. I was, <laughs> I was feeling a lot of stress just watching him being up that high while I was in my lazy boy taking it easy, right? But we need that. And there's a physical thing. Dopamine actually helps us doing retaining. So we can recall the stories. We can remember people who tell us the stories easier than just talking about facts and data. So they learn who we are, what we do, how we help. We can demonstrate verbal communication. What is our knowledge and what's in, what else is important? You know, who else is important to participate in what the activities that I did? how we think, how we process, and also invites conversation. So listening and attention increases, that neural coupling that I talked about. We build that emotional connection, which increases longer-term memory. And listeners remember the story connected to us and invites conversation. Number two, culture fit. The reason the culture fit, I mean, I almost put it as number one, because I believe culture is so strong as something that must match. So George says, you know, I want to make sure that they got all the I do's taken care of. Now I want to flip over to the I am's so I don't get just fooled by the technical skills. It's kind of curious because the more technical job descriptions that I see, the less soft skills I see listed on the job description. It's pretty interesting. It's like we don't really care what kind of person you are. Can you meet all these technical requirements? I remember inheriting an employee one time that I said, <clears throat> Can we just put him in a room? We'll feed him occasionally. We'll have a bathroom and a shower attached. No phone, no external communication. Can't talk to anybody. He does a fantastic job. But if he opens his mouth, we're in big trouble. <laughs> and he was a great technical person, but it, he did not have very good personal skills and didn't have good interaction with them. So he was a challenge to deal with and how to use him effectively. But anyway, he says, you know, personality doesn't match with a culture you run into problems. In other words, all that other stuff doesn't is as important as the culture fit. Culture is going to be one of the main aspects of making sure that this employee is a low risk hire. So, what are the, what is it? Culture is values and cult and, and the definition of those two. Well, values are beliefs and philosophies and principles, and culture includes the values. But they are shared, and it has attitudes, goals, practices, also the characterize of an institution. Culture fit. What do we need to do? What are your values? Do you know your top three or four values? What do you want to see in a corporation? Uh, maybe integrity is one of them. Uh, maybe teamwork or collaboration is one of them. Uh, easy to, to communicate with other people. I know in the last you know, one of the companies I worked for. There was no protocol for communication to anyone. You found the person with the knowledge, you went directly to them, okay? You didn't have to go through the chain of command or do anything like that. So what is your ideal culture? Where is the kind of environment that you love to work? Brian went to work for a company <clears throat> and it didn't work out so well. It you know, just, just wasn't a good place to work. And he went back and he looked and he did this uh, research on what does he really want to do? changed his target, changed his approach, said, this is what I really enjoy doing, found that job, found the right culture, and said, it's the greatest place to work. Everybody gets along well. It was a smaller company, but he just loved going to work there, and the team was really good. So now the next thing I want to do is, what are our questions to determine the working culture? Now, there's three kinds of culture that I say. <clears throat> when I learned this from one of Jeff's guest speakers, there's the posted culture. All right. That's what's on the website. There's the I want to be culture when the, the culture we're striving to get. Now, startup companies will, will try to work with this particularly and say, what, what's the kind of culture? Well, I remember Ross Perot when he started EDS, 
And the story goes, and he sat down and says, what do I want this company to be like? And he came down with the values and the mission and all that sort of thing of what the company was going to be, and then hired to that. And we need then to develop prioritized questions to determine the working culture, the third type, which is what really goes on here, right? <clears throat> and we don't, look, might not get a lot of questions, but we're going to get an opportunity to ask some questions. And I think that culture questions are among the most important. So determine your values, describe your ideal culture, and develop the questions. All right, the culture fit, knowing us. So I want to help you with this. What hence, Answer these questions. What are your core values? What is your purpose? When you go into a company, what's your purpose for working there? Now, I'm retired. What is my purpose? What do I do now? I am here, and I enjoy, and I love helping other people shorten their job search by building skills and confidence for successful job interviews. That's my purpose right now. That's why I do what I do. And everybody needs some sort of purpose. And so that's mine. But what's my personality like? What's my motivation? What kind of instincts, strengths? What are my experiences, interests, passion, dreams, goals, all that sort of thing. Look at those things and say, can you give me a couple of sentences that describe what motivates you? What are you trying to accomplish? What abilities do you have? What are your interests, et cetera? So we went back to their value statement, all that stuff I'll put in this slide again for all of them. This one has 148 in case you wanted some more. Yeah, I did look at these. <clears throat> and so here's all mine that fit. And then I stopped there because I thought I was getting a swelled head. I suggest we do this. Now I have another presentation on vetting values and culture and it includes this, which is we should build a values culture table. What culture and value are you looking for? <clears throat> so let's say it's teamwork and collaboration is the pick one. So can you define it? If we can't define it and talk about it and describe it in an interview, well, I think we're missing the point. So I'll, I want to be able to understand what it actually is. All right? Now, what's so what? What good is teamwork and collaboration? What does it do for us? And now here's five or six bullets that I put in here. Here's some of the value of the value or the culture, the value of the value. How does it look in an organization? What are they doing in here to show that this value or culture item is at work? It actually works here. How do you, how do you know that it's working? How, do you, how is it applied? And then, based on all those demonstrated buys, I can say, now, let me ask some questions or prepare a list of questions so I can say, you know, what's going on and what happens? Do they have the flexible approaches? How do they reward people and teams? And I can start asking these questions to determine if teamwork and collaboration. And you do that for every one of them. So you take your top five, your strengths, and the cultural definitions of what, of what you're looking for, and you go through this process for each one so that you can describe it, you understand what the value of it is, you know what it looks like, and you've got some questions that you can ask to determine if it's alive and well. What do you think the most significant thing we can do to set ourselves and differentiate ourselves from other candidates? I've been talking too much. Somebody's tell me. Smile and sound upbeat. Okay. You say wow and sound upbeat? Smile. Smile. And sound. Okay. Smile. All right. Yep. Sit on the edge of our seats. Okay. Now, as, how do we do that? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to answer my own question. We do it by what we're thinking and feeling that generates smile and being upbeat. <laughs> Would you agree that what we think and what we're feeling determines our actions, our words, the words we say, how we say the words, the expression on our face, all comes from what we're thinking. Therefore, being genuine and authentic, what are we thinking prior to the interview? One is what I mentioned earlier. Please, God, help me answer these questions. All right. <clears throat> That's the low end of the spectrum. The high end is I'm excited about the interview. I'm looking forward to meeting this person, building a new friend. All right. Building a, a connection that actually is connection, not just a contact. All right. I'm looking forward to doing that for that potential which means I'm interested in them, I'm interested in their, their side of things, as well as what I can offer. That's good. Anything else? Smile. 
do your, do your due diligence and research the company um, and come be come prepared with some questions. All right. All right. So walking in with knowledge about the company and demonstrating that knowledge and being prepared with that is huge. How many candidates do you think actually do that? Where do we stand? Uh, since I've interviewed quite a few people, and I know that uh, David's been on the pit crew panel, he's interviewed, and he's had interviewing, you know, hired people in his past. And not too many people show that. Most are just trapped into the answering questions uh, arena. If our mindset is, oh no, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. I'm going to I'm going to show you my preparation. So that's good. Well, the upbeat I think tops it out because that positive attitude and enthusiasm comes across very very strong. Now, if you don't have the, uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm a very introverted person as you can tell, and so what do I do? Uh, well, I, I get excited about what's going on. I, I, I'm very energized by doing presentations and doing workshops and helping people and going through that. That, that That's very positive for me. Uh, I really get into it. I may not feel that good. I may be a little tired and then I get into the workshop and away I go and more, I'm, I'm, I'm up and at them. I just love it doing that. So that positive attitude, enthusiasm. Or high interest, if you're not necessarily an extrovert, uh, that high interest will be will do the same thing. So let me ask you this, since it's so important, how important do you think it is? So here's a poll. What percent do you think of the decision to hire is based on the enthusiasm and interest in two things, not only the job, but the company as well? Sarah, are you related to David? Yes, I'm very much related to David. We oh. we have the same coffee cups. Oh, you're his daughter. <laughs> no, this is his wife. <laughs> you're too kind, Walt. I need to put kind on my strengths. <laughs> okay, you're waiting on two people. One more to go. Who hasn't voted? Here we go. Here we go. go. All right. You want to share the results? Yep, there you go. Thank you, sir, Jeff. Appreciate the help with these polls. Uh, so one person is thinking uh, below 50% range. And we've got one in the 50 to 60, and then it increases with two people, 61 to 70, four people. So on eight, eight. Well, we've got all but one saying it's more than half. Okay, and I, um, without getting to specifics about the person who said half, it's still a significant percentage compared to all the other things that we can look at. We've got a huge amount of people saying that when I'm hiring somebody, they're interested in enthusiasm. You know, if you walk in to a, a job search and you're hiring people. Just about everybody can do the job. That's not the strong differentiator. I mean, it's certainly a, a prerequisite, right? But it's not that. But it's the person who says, you know, they just, they can't wait to get started here. When we talked about the role, they love doing this stuff and they, you know, really enjoy doing it. And they like the benefits of the value of what they can do here and helping us do these things. So ideally, both parties can't wait to get started. And they're excited about hiring us as we're excited about getting hired. All right. That is the ideal. If you've taken a job that you can do, but not one that energizes you, it's going to show up in the interview. Now, we may have to do that. So I suggest that we reframe to say job B, which I'm having to take now for all the other parameters that require me to do that, will help me get to job A. And I do a great job with job B, and I'm energized and excited about doing that because it's going to show that I can get to job A later. All right. Just a suggestion and a thought about that. But the vast majority are saying, you know, so if you come down to all things being equal, it's going to be the interest and enthusiasm. 
strong differentiator. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you all for sharing on that. So attitude is everything. Well, if y'all any of y'all going to Stonebriar Church where Frisco Connect makes their preacher there has a great little flyer on attitude and, and the impact of that. But old Abe Lincoln, you know, says we're about as happy as we want to be. I know a few people that are always jubilant. I don't know if it, maybe it's been quite a while since Pamela Gargis has been around, right, Jeff? But what, what was Pamela like? Oh, <laughs> always happy. upbeat, right? Very happy. Yeah, she added to our day, all right? She was a person that says, uh, you know, she's one of those that adds energy in her relationships to people rather than one who's the sourpuss and draws energy away from us. You would think that she has no problems in the world, but she doesn't have any pressures or negative things going on in her life. Let me ask you, anybody here that's participating that not have any problems and issues going on in your life, raise your hand. <laughs> I mean, we all do. It's all there, but you never know it through her. And it's all in her attitude how we did that. Now, it's part of her personality, but at the same time, we can get a little bit more interested and excited because before we go into the interview, we talk to ourselves, give us some positive self-talk, talk about how we are excited about the job. I mean, it, you truly are. You just have to get there, all right? We have to replace this, oh, I hope I can answer questions with this, oh, this is going to be great. I'll, I'll enjoy this conversation that I'm having with me talking to these people, all right? 46% of new hires fail within 18 months, and 41% fail from the attitude rather than the skills. Uh, one person got the job, quit in four months, says, huh, I don't like working there. And it was a culture thing. Found the job where the culture fit, and she was very, very happy with getting the new role. So the most important element of, our, of a successful interview is our demonstration of genuine enthusiasm and our interest in the job and the company. It has the highest voting percentage of the reasons to hire. You told me that yourself. You said it's over 50%. Therefore, what job causes that? What type of company culture causes that? Target that, and then it's automatic. It's generic. That's who you are. That's the way you what you be. And all the other stuff goes away. Let's talk just briefly. Greetings. Somebody mentioned smiling, how important that was. Which picture stands out? Jump in and tell me. The baby. <laughs> Anybody like Julia Roberts up on the right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody's smiling. Yeah. Does anybody here have a negative feeling when they see a smiling baby? <laughs> no. What's going on? Our bodies are reacting to smile. We actually have positive things, dopamines, other things are going on in our, in our, to make us feel good when we see a smile. All right. And then what does it often generate? It generates a smile within us. And that makes the other person feel good. So we're getting double duty here. We're getting Two things happen to us to make us feel good and smiling. But we don't smile to smile. I have two smiles. Walt, well, don't take your picture, which is a facial contortion. But if I'm really interested and excited about meeting someone, I will smile when I meet. A lot of people smile when they meet, then it disappears and it, and it stops. But if you are genuinely excited about the role of the job, you like talking about the job, you like talking about the stories that you have to tell you, these things are just going to show up. It's not a technique, it's just a result. So here's what George says, how you look and speak matters on the first impressions. All right, how long does it take you to determine trustworthiness from meeting a person the first time? I'm just picking one example. Oh, we're answering pretty fast today. It's pretty good. I appreciate that. Still have two to go. One to go. 
And done. Oh, woke up from their nap. Great. All right. All right. So what do we say here? Uh, and, you know, less than one second is uh, one person. Then we go three up to five, six up to 10, two, 15, and then greater than that, we've got four. All right, well, let me give you some statistics here. I think I can stop that. Princeton University did a, a little study and some research about judgments on attractiveness, likability, trustworthy, et cetera, just within a fraction of a second after seeing someone's face. Trustworthiness was the quickest within one-tenth of a second. <laughs> so we had one person that hit the category that at least agrees with the Princeton University research, say, faster than we think, much faster. We would like to think that people would get to know us before they make these decisions. Well, I'll tell you what, we don't do that. We make decisions by looking at people right up front. Now, I know a woman who, who, who I met at my church many years ago when I was still in high school, and I thought she was the homeliest person I'd ever seen. I got to know her. I thought she was the most beautiful person I'd ever seen. Her personality, her way of communicating, talking, uh, the joy to be around her and all that stuff, it just changed my whole perception of beauty and what that was. And so I was, you know, I made a serious mistake in making this judgment right up front. However, we are judging people. We make these decisions right up front and trustworthiness. And I mentioned earlier, uh, who here is not trustworthy? I think we all want to be trustworthy. And I'm surprised that it's such, it's such an important value that we have that I'm not seeing it on our list of soft skills uh, on a resume or in an interview. You can trust me. I put it in the sample answer. I said, you can rely on me. It means you can trust me to do these things, all right? It's the quickest. Up to a whole second didn't change much, but increased time led to a more differentiated personal impression. Therefore, we want that first impression to be good. The first impression. How many times have we heard that the first impression is creating the filter with how I'm going to now listen to you? I don't know if you heard that much, but, you know, that first impression, we've all heard how, how important they are. So that greeting and that smile and what we have. So I suggest we have this genuine mindset. We're smiling. We are have, have excitement to meet the interviewer, to talk about the job in the company, looking forward to having a conversation and discuss this opportunity and knowing that we can bring value. So, well, I can't wait to tell you all the things that I can do for you. All right. So it's a very, very positive mindset that says, hey, this is going to be great. It's not a fearful interview. It's not a stressful interview. It's a fun interview. How do you get there? I'll tell you in a second. One of the things I want to do in the greeting, besides the greeting itself, is the part B of the opening, is your opening statement, is the part B of the initial introduction of a person. And here's a suggested outline I have. I'll put this in the workshop. It's not a required outline. It's a suggested outline that I think I got into my career. Okay, how did I do it? When I was uh, in college, I took a summer job and they put a computer across the hall. I actually left my job on that computer and I've been in information technology ever since. And I love focusing on customer services. With my experience in, and I'm going to talk about development, uh, programming, implementations, uh, service sale, whatever it is, oh, I can achieve this. So I'm going to list my experience, a couple of things there relevant to the job, some scoff sales relevant to the job, one or two each, and then give an example of how I can add value combining those two. I left my last position. Uh, I enjoyed working at my last job, learned a lot, contributed a lot, but now I'm moving on and to this, I would like to tell you, and you can, you know, if you were downsized, you can say I were downsized or something. And if you have something else that was pretty negative, you need to call me so we can talk about why you left your last job. But why don't we just go ahead and tell them that right up front briefly in the opening statement. And I'm going to answer why I want to work here. I'm going to give you two reasons why this job energizes me and the value it brings. And the company, why do I want to work? at this company? What is it about product, service, culture, et cetera, that attracts you to that company? 
specifically I'm interested in this job and tenant, can you tell me what are the top three characteristics for a person to be successful in this role? Now, I mentioned this in a uh, presentation on Monday, and the person said, uh, it looks like you're trying to take over the interview by asking the question. I said, okay, what if we rephrase this? And now that I've told you something about so would, would it be all right now if you would be willing to share and then you ask the question, all right? You have the opportunity to say yes or no, if it makes you feel a bit better in asking the question. I think the question is important. We're selling. What are they looking for? We need to find out. We need to find out up front what they're looking for so that we can address it and talk about it during the interview. We cannot assume. Start with the job description and find out from each person. What do they think is most important? What does operations think? What does sales think? What does IT think? What does uh, marketing think? What does the CIO, director, VP, what do they think? So uh, one person uh, went into an interview, interviewed a whole bunch of people, and this goes back to how I like to the asking questions things. But when he walked in and started talking to him, the, the, the CEO said, well, you've been through a lot of things here. What questions do you have? And that was his opening statement. And the candidate says, well, I think everything's pretty much been answered. <laughs> he didn't have any questions. He didn't get hired. I mean, you're not interested in the CEO's perspective of this role. You don't, you know, you're not, you know, you don't have any questions like that. Oh, what a mercy. But that was that was his, you know, opening to the to the meeting with the CEO was no, I don't think I have anything else to say. Another one is the how I can help. So Two questions up front, not consecutively, I think are very, very strong. What are you looking for as far as the person? And what are your expectations for me in this role? How can I help you? Question. And who are you looking for? One of those. The last thing is uh, closing. Uh, biggest thing I see is that people don't close. And here's kind of some steps. Showing interest, showing adding value to a trial close. Know the whole process for hiring. Do more than just ask for the next step. Asking when will I hear back from someone? Who will it be? If I don't hear from them by this date, uh, what date should I expect to hear back from them? You know, so it's got all those kind of elements in it. And you want to, we call it asking for the job in the biz, but it's not necessarily asking for the job. It's basically, are we going to the next step? What does it look like? Do you see me fitting into this role? Those kinds of things. Fred said, his feedback was a good industry and product experience, all right? A good knowledge and a good idea, but he lacked energy. Didn't really display a strong new business hunting attitude, wrong attitude in comparison to others interviewed. And Joe's story got feedback. So they told me I was the only candidate that really showed enthusiasm for the job. That's how big an impact that is. So George says, passionate about what they're doing, excited about their experience, and how it comes to play here, i.e. value, with some energy about getting the job done. All that stuff says, that tells me the, the result is they value getting the job done. You start with preparation and research. You then work on content. Then you practice your content. You build then skills and confidence, which generates energy, enthusiasm, and interest. So we don't walk in with it. You have to work at doing some things so that you will have that energy, enthusiasm, and interest. And there are the 10 things on distinctive interview. Here's your decision tree for practicing. You know, with me, with the informal, learning how to sell and to differentiate. And then the panel interviews with the Dallas Pit crew, uh, mock interviews off of your resume and job description. I'm glad to have you sign up and also participate. It looks like Ron's got a lot going. There's the QR code. Last thing I want to share with you is attitude, kindness, respect, optimism, giving, and happiness as a choice. Whatever choices you make, make you. And I'm a few minutes over. It was all that stuff up front, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to unmute your mic and ask away. Ask Walt. Hello, oh, Anthony. Questions, questions? I have a quick one about, um, it seems like most interviews I've been on now have been video interviews versus in-person interviews. Um, 
you know, because those are remote positions or something like that, do you think that's going to be the norm now is going to be more video interviews versus in-person interviews? I think they'll grow, all right? Uh, in the interview, video interviewing presentation that uh, is one of the 13 sessions, uh, the idea of, from a corporate standpoint, how advantageous it is to them is pretty strong. Um, you know how hard it is to get three people together in a company anymore? I mean, it's, it's just difficult. So if I can do a one-way interview and I can just tell you these questions, you can answer them, then these people can look at them at their own time. You know, So that's a real positive for them. Uh, they get to ask the same questions and they compare apples to apples, you know, and they can look people and they're going to see how people, and, and I'm not so disappointed that we had to do everything on Zoom because guess what? A lot of work is being done online today. And sure. so how do you appear online? How do you look? How do you feel? How do you represent this company by how, your presence you know, online? Well, I think we need to learn how to be online and do a much better job in our communications and effective. So I see it growing. I'm hoping that, that there will still be some in-person things. Uh, I know of one person who got a job with, the, uh, I guess it was the IRS of the Northern, I don't remember who that was, Jeff, you might remember. Didn't talk to a single person. Not a single person. <laughs> it's all done remotely. And I him say it's a great job. He really like it. He relocated for that. But yeah, I think it's going to continue on. Thank you. What do y'all think? Anybody think otherwise? No, Walt, I, I think you're right. Um, I, I was at a job recently where the first interview was always, it was always going to be a Zoom interview because it's it is quite, it's very cost effective. Uh, you don't have to have a security guard meet them at the front door or prepare things. It's just you turn it on. If you don't like them, you turn it off and you move forward. It's uh, I suspect it'll be uh, a screen interview with recruiting. Initial interview would probably be Zoom. And if they like you, they'll bring you in for a final interview in person. It does take some practice. And I really strongly recommend that you do practice online stuff. And I think you ought to use these meetings for practicing. I don't think y'all use these for your background and your appearance and all that. I suggest you engage in these things so that you can talk and you can get used to looking into the camera. There's a lot of things that I think that we can do in practice. We we really, if we come across a lot better on TV than the other people come across, that's going to be a significant factor in the hiring decision. Yep, very true. All right. Well, Walt, thank you very much for your time. Great information. A lot of information there. If people want to go back, you'll be able to go back and watch it online when the video gets posted a little bit later. Uh, just a reminder, Career DFW and Career Your Say, we're putting on training four days a week. Please join us. Uh, tomorrow being the first Thursday of the month, we're going to talk all about effective resumes. This primarily will be about resumes dealing with an ATS system when you file something online. It's also just a good basic format for most resumes and just some really basic resume tips that hopefully you'll come join us. If you wanna share your resume, you're welcome to do so tomorrow. Just take the header information off, but we are gonna look at one or two people's resumes if they like to share them with everybody. This Friday at the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group being the first Friday of the month, we are gonna do open forum. We're gonna talk about whatever it is you would like to talk about. Put on your pants, get out of the house, come join us in person, or if you live in the DFW area, the, the ice and snow should be over, but the uh, for everybody who lives outside the DFW area, please join us on Zoom or Facebook Live. Uh, next Tuesday for LinkedIn Tuesdays, Lock Alderson will be with us to talk about how to use LinkedIn for job hunting, strategies that gets results. And then next Wednesday, Tony Bashir will be with us to talk about the 10 biggest mistakes people make in interviewing. Tony runs Babbage & Associates. He owns Babbage & Associates, one of the largest uh, and oldest recruiting firms in the Southwest. So uh, he'll be with us next uh, Wednesday. Uh, this session has been recorded, so you will be able to go back and watch it. Uh, one of the things you will find on the Career USA YouTube channel is all 13 lessons. Like I said, we'll start this up again in the end of February. But uh, the first five lessons of what do you do before the interview, the second five interviews or what do you do during the interview? And then the last three are just some advanced topics on just some interviewing basics in general. 
So uh, if you'd like to go to the Career USA YouTube channel, click on playlist. Number one, subscribe to the channel. We'd really, really appreciate it. We'd love to hit a thousand members uh, who are subscribed to the channel. And then pick whichever playlist you want and uh, click on view full playlist. And when you do that, you can scroll down and find whatever lesson it is you'd like to go back and look at. If you're not receiving emails about our workshops from anybody, please join the Career USA mailing list. Just send an email to Career USA, the plus sign, subscribe at groups.io. And uh, you'll never be spammed. What you will get is the topic of the day, the title of the day, and most importantly, the Zoom link of the day. That way you can open the email and just uh, click on the Zoom link. Just a reminder, Career DFW, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Walt's a volunteer, I'm a volunteer, Ron's a volunteer, everybody uh, in Career DFW, we're all here just to help you land your next great opportunity. So thank you for joining us today, everybody. Have a great uh, th Wednesday. For those in DFW, uh, stay warm, and uh, hopefully we'll all be able to get out of the house by Friday. Talk to you later. Bye.